friends, good morning and welcome to our service. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and on behalf of the congregation of Leith Free Church, uh, you are most welcome. We've been studying these past few Sundays together the life and times of good King Josiah and we continue to do that today and may he bless us as we seek the truth of God in the Word of God. Let me read to you from Psalm 119 as we approach the Lord in worship together. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. Let us seek together to walk in his ways. We're going to have a psalm sung for us now, a recording of Sing Psalms. Psalm 29 uh, will be played to the tune Denio. Psalm 29, a psalm of worship and adoration and praise of God, you mighty ones. Give to the Lord as his right. Ascribe to the Lord God both glory and might. To the Lord's name due glory and honour accord. In the beauty of holiness, worship the Lord. These wonderful words of praise and adoration set the tone for what we're thinking about this morning as we turn back to the life of good King Josiah. We find that he was not just a worker, but he was above all a worshipper. And that's what these words in Psalm 29 speak of. The Lord over floods sits as monarch alone. The Lord sits forever as king on his throne. The Lord makes the strength of his people increase. The Lord gives his people the blessing. Of peace. Let us pray to the Lord together. Lord, we thank you today for this time we have to spend in worship before you. We come, Lord, in humility and dependence. We bow before you. We acknowledge you to be the living God, the King of kings. And we come to you, Lord, and ask for your grace, uh, your mercy, and your peace. Open your word, we pray to you this morning. Bless uh, your word to our hearts. And may we know what it is to meet with the living God. May we truly humble ourselves before you. Listen and learn and live for you 
Through faith in Jesus Christ, your Son, hear us, we pray in his name. Amen. Two short readings from the Old Testament scriptures uh, today. First from Deuteronomy and 17, if you have your Bible. Deuteronomy 17, reading from verse... Um, where are we now? Deuteronomy 17, read from verse 14, a short section about the principles of kingship. How was the king of God's people to conduct himself? And then we'll turn forward and read from 2 Kings and chapter 23. The word of instruction by Moses to the Lord's people uh, before they entered the promised land. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers uh, you shall set as a king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold, and when he sits in the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests, and it shall be with him. And he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of his law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. The focus of the king the conduct and character of the king was to be shaped by the word of God and it shall be with him and he shall read in it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God. Now we turn forward to Second Kings and we'll read a short passage from chapter 23 and verse 21. Uh, what happens after Josiah has set about purging the land from idolatry we find he turns to God in worship. And the king commanded all the people, keep the Passover to the Lord your God, as it is written in this book of the covenant. For no such Passover had been kept since the days of the judges who judged Israel, or during all the days of the kings of Israel, or of the kings of Judah. But in the eighteenth year of King Josiah, this Passover was kept to the Lord in Jerusalem. Moreover, Josiah put away the mediums and necromancers and the household gods and the idols and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might establish the words of the law that were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. Before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him, arise after him. Amen. May the word of God be blessed to our hearts today. Our Lord and our God, we bow before you today. We give you thanks for the opportunity we have to worship together. And we ask as we would seek your face, Lord, for that heart and understanding of what it is to worship the living God, that our focus should be entirely on who you are, and on what you have done, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Our loving Heavenly Father, we rejoice in this great provision, this incredible declaration of love and mercy and grace, which we see ultimately expressed upon the cross where Jesus went for us where Jesus died, that we might live. Lord our God, may we today, as we worship before you, do so in a spirit of humility and gratitude and rejoicing in the good news that there is hope and peace and forgiveness through trust in Jesus Christ. Lord, we confess our sin today. We acknowledge that often we are not what we could be. We are not what we should be. We ask, Lord, for your forgiveness. 
and as we seek your cleansing and renewal. So, Lord, we ask that we might be lifted up, that you might grant strength where there is weakness, that you might, Lord, grant peace where there is restlessness, that you might, Lord, grant joy where there is sadness, that you might lift us up, Lord, but we know that that process begins with our bowing down. And so as we worship, we remember the words of the psalm already that has been sung in praise to your name uh, this morning in our service. A psalm of adoration and wonderment. A psalm of worshipfulness that would say, not unto us, Lord, not unto us, but to your name be the glory. As we today, Lord, again turn to the life and times of good King Josiah, May we learn there. May we take to heart the principle there to set you first before all that we do and seek to accomplish in life. That we would seek first the kingdom of God, knowing that all other things will be added thereby. Help us, Lord, to get things right. Help us, Lord, to get this order right. That we would put God first. That you would be a forethought, not an afterthought. Lord, bless us as a congregation. As a denomination, we have recently marked a day of prayer across our church. And so we pray, Lord, that you would again draw near to us, that you would hear our petitions and our requests, that you would bless, Lord, all that is uh, done today uh, to your glory in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Bless your word to us now, Lord, as we seek to learn together. May we commit ourselves anew to you. We take an example from Josiah who points us to the greatest example, the King of Kings who would come after him, Jesus Christ, your Son. And may we live for him in all that we do, seeking to be that city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid, that the light of the, the gospel would shine from us, that we would show forth the praises of him who called us from darkness into his marvellous light. In all these things, we seek the forgiveness of our sin and your blessing, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Boys and girls, how are you today? I hope you've had a good week. I hope things are going well for you. And um, I hope you're doing okay and that you're in good form, helping mum and dad uh, at home and looking after your brothers and sisters as well. That's what it's all about, isn't it, really? Now, I often ask you about... Uh, how good you are at remembering things. I'm not very good at remembering. I'm always forgetting stuff and wondering, oh, where did I write? Especially at my desk when I'm writing things down and I'm marking things. And, oh, I'll remember that later. And then I can't remember. And something I use a lot to help me are these. You know what they are. Highlighters. Now, I liked this one initially. I thought this would be good, but I discovered that purple is quite a deep colour. And if you take the highlighter and you mark something with it, it's quite dark and becomes difficult uh, to read. So, not so, but these, these are my faves. I like these ones. Now, highlighters help me because quite often if I'm reading books, I've got a lot of books here, and you build up a lot of books as a minister over the years. And when you read things, you know, oh, that's amazing, that's great, that really helps me understand something in the Bible. One of the best things to do then, right away, highlight it. Highlight it. I'm going to put up a couple of pictures and you'll see uh, a couple of snapshots of my Bible. And you'll see there how the highlighter, bam, what it makes to, what happens is, poof, right away, your eye is drawn right to that colour, isn't it? You go right to the colour and it's yellow or it's pink or it might be blue, not, uh, not so much purple. Um, and then you can see right away, oh, what was that? And you look again. Wow, there it is. So, highlighters. They are a really, really handy, helpful thing. They're called highlighters because that's what they do. They simply highlight something and they help you to find it. They help you to remember something. But what they really do, they make something stand out, don't they? You look at these pictures again. There's a wee photo I put in there of the Shorter Catechism. It's a, an amazing little book that tells us in a series of questions and answers so much about what the Bible teaches us. And one paint page in there, and you'll see it there with the orange and yellow, boom, your eye just goes straight to the question and it helps you to remember things. So what I want you to remember today is one verse, and I'll just read it to you now from the Gospel of John in the New Testament. Uh, John's Gospel, 
and chapter 8 and verse 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. When we trust in Jesus, when we pray to him, and when we seek to honour him, follow him, to live as Christians, men and women, boys and girls, we become like highlighters, living highlighters. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Boys and girls, to live as a Christian is to be like a highlighter. And you're not drawing attention to yourself. And I am not saying for a moment that you're to rush off and grab a highlighter and colour in yourself or your brother or your sister. That is not what I'm saying. No. What I'm saying is as we learn the Bible and as we take the Bible into our hearts, and as we highlight the Bible in how we live, we have the light of life and we become living highlighters. And people see Jesus in us and through us. What an amazing privilege that is. May God help us all to be highlighters of Jesus this week. Lord, we pray today for the boys and girls. We thank you so much that we can spend time together. We value them so much in our fellowship, in our congregations. And we pray, Lord, for your blessing upon all the boys and girls today. Help us all to live for you, to follow you that we would have the light of life shining from us. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles and you'd like to turn to Second Chronicles in chapter 35 and maybe keep an eye on Second Kings in chapter 23, also the chapter we read from the, uh, earlier today, uh, where from verses 21 to 23, we have a snapshot of something that was absolutely fundamental to how Josiah came to be called good in the Bible itself. He commanded all the people to keep the Passover to the Lord your God. In just three verses we have a snapshot. But when we turn forward to Second Chronicles 35, we're given far more than an up, a snapshot. The, the summary of Second Kings 23 is here unpacked in wonderful splendour in Second Chronicles 35. And what it shows us today is this, that as well as the work he carried out on obliterating idolatry from Judah and Jerusalem and southern parts of the kingdom of Israel. The emphasis here becomes, uh, focuses on the worship he observed. And that's the two strands we have to Josiah, the work he carried out in ridding the land of idolatry and idolatrous practices and the pagan rites and the pagan priesthood that had led the people down a black hole of wickedness and rebellion and sinfulness. And now we have the worship he observed. Earlier, speaking to the children, I was using highlighters. A highlighter, what a highlighter does, of course, it draws the eye, doesn't it? It immediately draws your attention to something that you want to remember, something you need to know for future reference, something you don't want to forget. And that's what we have here in the scripture. We have a searchlight that focuses upon this good king and his heart. And in his heart, we see a desire and a willingness and a determination to worship the Lord his God. And so as a good leader, he showed the way and he went the way. We thought about that last week, how uh, someone has said leadership involves knowing the way, going the way and showing uh, the way. Well, that's what he does here. Uh, Josiah kept a Passover to the Lord in Jerusalem. 2 Kings 35 verse 1 and 2 Kings 23 verse 21, the same instance, we're told the king commanded all the people, keep the Passover to the Lord your God as it is written in this book of the covenant. So we're not told much about good King Josiah. We know that of the 20 uh, kings of Judah we're told of in the scripture, only eight are determined, uh, defined, described as good. And here we have perhaps the best of all. And good King Josiah, who at eight began to seek the Lord uh, and who at 12 began uh, to lead the people 
as uh, he as he sought the Lord and began to live for him. And then at 20, the, the scripture is rediscovered as he sets about a program of restoring the temple to its former splendor and centrality in the life and thinking and uh, worship of, of uh, the people of Judah. And here, here at 26, as the purge of idolatry continues, Josiah reconstitutes by covenanting himself before the Lord and the people. Uh, here we see him reconstituting the feast of the Passover as the people again come back to God in worship and dependence and humility. The reforms are well underway by this stage and his personal stand for the Lord is clear to all to see the work he has carried out in obliterating idolatry is now blended with the worship he observed. 2 Chronicles 35 is a long chapter uh, and we're going to read through it next week uh, together. I thought it was a bit too long perhaps to put up on the screen. Um, so that's why I read from 2 Kings today to give a snapshot of this. But next week, this is the reading we're going to go through. And if you have time this week, I'd really encourage you, if you can, to read through 2 Chronicles 35 to look at the worship Josiah observed. We're going to look at it today and next week. We're just going to notice three things about it today and we're going to notice a few other things about it next week. So this, this chapter is too important just to try and cram in uh, to one attempted sermon on it. So we need two sessions today then. We're going to think about the worship he observed. And I want to say this right away. First of all, that one of the principles that comes through this good king's life that we need to take to heart today we need to understand and accept, is that you cannot be right with God in isolation to worship. It doesn't work. It doesn't happen. It can't happen. If we are right with God, we will be people of worship. John Calvin, the great reformer and the leading theologian at a time of great upheaval as the church broke away from the darkness of middle-aged superstition and formality and ritual, said this, the first foundation of righteousness undoubtedly is the worship of God. Now what does that mean? The first foundation of righteousness undoubtedly is the worship of God. It tells us this, we cannot make things right between ourselves and God on our terms. We cannot work our way to heaven and we will not get there just because we think we should. No. And when we recognise this, we will express that understanding in how we worship and in how we live. And how we live will be conducted, shaped, moulded and driven by how we worship. So throughout this, there's a question, a recurring question. What place does worship have in your life? What place does worship have week by week? As you make your plans, as you think ahead, as we all can at the moment anticipate this vaccine coming, maybe normality will be restored. Maybe how... The upheaval of 2020 will be a thing of the past, maybe. One day the vaccine, hopefully, God willing, will be available to us all and we'll maybe one day be thinking back, oh, that was some year, that coronavirus restrictions, social distancing, the upheaval, the financial chaos. As we think about these things and perhaps begin to think about 2021 and the plans and hopes and aspirations and dreams that we have for that year, can I ask you simply today, where does God feature in your planning? Where is God when you think of 2021? We cannot make ourselves right with God. We need to begin with worship. The Psalms are full of this reality. Lord, from the depths to thee I cried, my voice, Lord, do thou hear. Are we prepared to bow the knee? Are we men and women, boys and girls today, who acknowledge the living God as our creator, the sovereign king of kings and lord of lords? That's what we're about uh, each time we meet 
online and on a Sunday, and God willing, in church, when church can be resumed as a normal practice week by week, I cannot encourage you enough, I cannot plead with you enough to make church a regular pattern in your life. When churches reopen and when the vaccine allows normal travelling and when we no longer have to be concerned perhaps about wearing masks and the discomfort of social distancing, please, church, make it part of who you are. Make it part of what you do. Make it part of what defines you, worshipping God. Now, the thing that we need to take from the worship that um, uh, Josiah observed, first of all, is this. Verse 1, 2 Chronicles 35 tells us, Josiah kept a Passover to the Lord in Jerusalem. The first thing it tells us here then, it's regulated, his worship is regular. We gather Sunday by Sunday by Sunday. We meet on a Wednesday. We have a regulative pattern to our worship as a Christian congregation ought to do and every Christian congregation will have an opportunity to present to our people, to gather together, albeit online at the moment, on Zoom and maybe on a midweek, or if you can, where the buildings allow and social distancing allows, gather together in church regular. Now, by calling for the Passover to be observed, Josiah ensured that worship would become a regular event among his people for too long. Judah had um, uh, Judah's preference to indulge themselves had been revealed in their decision to forget God, and what an awful decision that was. You turn back to 2 Kings in chapter 23 and read verse 26 and 27. You'll have some of the most difficult verses in the Bible to read. Still, the Lord did not turn from the burning of his great wrath by which his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations of which Manasseh had provoked him. That was Josiah's grandfather. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also from out of my sight, as I have removed Israel, and I will cast off this city that I have chosen, Jerusalem, and the house of which I said, my name shall be there. You see what had happened in Judah, in Jerusalem, under Manasseh, Omri, and many, many other kings. The house of God, the temple, that had been set up as a building to retain the name of God and to emphasise and symbolise the presence of God with his people had become a workshop for idols. Idols were being built there. Idols were being commissioned there and they were being set up in the house of God in defiance of God and to desecrate his place and in complete rejection of his place as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hardness of heart is a frightening thing. Jeremiah, who would come to the fore during Josiah's uh, kingship, preached message after message about how the people had turned from God. And Jeremiah speaks there of the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. A hardness of heart expressing its sinfulness and indulging in a life of sin is what leads Judah to follow the leading of Manasseh, who in, in his lifetime was determined to do all that he could uh, to lead the people away from uh, from God. Manasseh rebuilt the high places that Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed, and he erected altars for Baal and made an Asherah, as Ahab, king of Israel, had done, and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. And then we're told this, 2 Kings 21, verse 4, he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord and burned his son as an offering and used fortune telling and omens and dealt with mediums and with necromancers and did much evil in the sight of the Lord provoking the Lord to anger. My friend, it absolutely matters. It absolutely matters today where your heart is. Josiah knew this. 
He saw the darkness that the people had been engaged in for those decades and he set about expelling it and exposing it by in instituting the regular worship of God. What sin did then, you see, sin does today. Sin hardens the heart and pushes God out, rejects God, denies God, avoids God. God is dethroned, self is enthroned. It was crucial that he reinstate regular worship in Judah at this time. And it's absolutely crucial for our well-being, for our being able to live in a manner that would please and honour God, that part of who we are and what we do involves regular worship of God. So at, this, so at this time we see that uh, in the worship he observed it was regulated, it was regular. He kept a Passover to the Lord in Jerusalem. Verse 2 tells us, secondly, that this worship was ordered. Um, Josiah appointed the priests to their offices and encouraged them in the service of the house of the Lord. Remember the Bible, the scripture had been lost for those decades now it had been rediscovered, found in the ruins and abject uh, mess that the temple had become. And Josiah, in reading this word, immediately responded to the God of the word. He tore his clothes, he repented and sought the Lord. And now he encourages the priests to their offices and encouraged them in the service of the house of the Lord. This worship is ordered. <clears throat> You see, Josiah didn't just do what he thought would be right. He didn't think, well, that's a good idea. I'll do it this way, and that's nice, so I think I'll do that. And he certainly didn't think, well, that'll appeal to the people. That's popular. That'll be cool. That'll go down well. I'll do it that way. No. Josiah began with the word of God as he brought the people to the God of the word, which is why we have the Bible at the centre of all we do and all we say as the denomination Sunday by Sunday. We put the word of God at the centre of who we are and what we do in order to live for God and come to the God of the word. He knew, he did what he knew was right in the worship of God by ordering his worship according to the word of God. Notice in verse 6 this phrasing. Uh, there's the slaughter of the animals for the sacrifice, for the, for the, or, or for the ritualistic part, the offering up of um, the sacrifice by the priests, and slaughter the Passover lamb, consecrate yourselves and prepare for your brothers to do according to the word of the Lord by Moses. According to the word of the Lord. If you read through Second Chronicles chapter 35, you'll find that phrase, according to the word of the Lord, nine times. That tells us something, doesn't it? There's a principle here. It's a guiding, fundamental principle for the Church of Christ today. That the word of God sets us on our path, dominates our thinking, our practice, our projects, our ideas, our plans, our hopes, our aspirations, whatever they might be. They must be centred upon, grounded in the word of God. We're here today not to talk about ourselves and to point to, to what we do and our history and our traditions and our teaching, all of which are good and important. No, we're here today to share and declare God's truth. The word, I'm speaking again to the children earlier, and we read from John in chapter 8. It's words that you'll know well, I am sure. Words that very much bring to mind this, um, this, this emphasis. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You follow Christ. The church, I believe, can be summed up in this way, the church of Christ on earth. Bible-based, Christ-centred, spirit-filled. Bible-based, Christ-centred and spirit-filled. We find this principle here in how Josiah said about his work and then the worship he observed. The phrase in according to appears nine times in Second Chronicles chapter 35. In worship as in life, it matters what we do, and how we do it. In our prayers, in our preaching, in our praise. What are we doing? We're giving God his rightful place in our hearts and in our lives. 
in his commentary on Exodus, John L. Mackay, known to so many of us, said this, speaking about the, the, the wording of chapter 20 and the building of altars to God and the use of the word remember. He said, this points to the essence of worship in its focus on the character and activity of God. Too many churches in Scotland today get it the wrong way round. And they look at culture, and they look at community, and they look at politics, and they look at society, and they look at trends, and they look at popular thinking, and philosophy, and you name it, the list goes on and on and on, and think, well, let's engage with that, and then see if we can bring them, perhaps, to this. No, wrong way round. Our worship and our theology begin entirely with our focus on the character and activity of God. And we tell the world around us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. In worship, as in life, it matters what we do and how we do it. And in the worship of Second Chronicles in chapter 35, we have this great principle set before us that we are to give God his rightful place in our hearts. And incredible things happen when we do this. I want to just remind you, perhaps you'll know, about William Wilberforce, who died in 1833. Very prominent figure in the 19th century politics. He was uh, the leading figure in the fight to abolish slavery. Um, he was buried in Westminster Abbey. And some years later, a statue was placed there uh, in his, uh, to honour him and uh, a memorial of him and all that he achieved in life. There's an inscription under that statue in Westminster Abbey that pays tribute to William Wilberforce's life and his achievements. And it includes the acknowledgement in this line. It says this, that to all he achieved, he added the abiding eloquence of a Christian life. He added the abiding eloquence of a Christian life. Who knows, friends, how God could use us this week. Let us ensure that we get things in the right order. We might not be the, the called to a place of prominence like William Wilberforce was. Very few are, and very few can carry it off successfully to the glory of God as he did. But what we can do it's whatever we do engage with and whatever we do seek to achieve, we can, through faith in Jesus Christ, add the abiding eloquence of a Christian life to whatever we set our hand to. And may he help us to do that as we get the principles right, worshipping God, beginning by focusing on his character and his activity so that we do not get things the wrong way round. So as well as being regular and regulated and ordered, we see this finally, that in chapter 35 in Second Chronicles, this worship was instructive. It was instructive. We see this in verses 7 uh, and uh, in 17, uh, where Josiah contributed to the lay people. And in verse 17, the people of Israel who were present kept the Passover. Who was instructed? As we see this repeated phrase of according to the word of the Lord, what was going on? Who was being instructed? The people. The people who had been gathered in. The people who had been called in. No one exempt, no one excused, no one excluded, but all called in to the worship of God. No one was beyond the call to come before God in worship. You see, what this tells us is as we serve God and as we make his worship a central feature of who we are and as we set time aside day by day and week by week to learn from him and live for him and follow him. We honour God. We put him first. But the other side of that same coin is this, that if worship is not a repeated feature of our lives, if his word is not a repeated feature of how we live and think and go about our business day by day and week by week, then not only are we not honouring God, we are actively denying him. And that's what had happened 
here in Josiah's time. The temple that had been set there in Jerusalem, that had long since replaced the tabernacle, the, the tent of worship in the book of the Exodus where God had been with his people and they had gathered there in worship and to present their sacrificial offerings, to present their praise where Moses and the priesthood had interceded on their behalf. And now we have the temple replacing the, the tabernacle. But what's happened? Is it resounding to the, with the prayers of the people? Is the Levitical priesthood offering the sacrifices and interceding on the behalf of the people as a high priest, leading them in prayer as the king set an example? No. As we've seen already today, the temple is resounding to the practice uh, of idolatry. It had become a workshop. Men were in there making, in the courts of the temple, making idols to worship the deities of the pagan nations around them and all the cultic practices and abominations and immorality that had swept in straight away had led Israel down a dark path that has at its heart a fundamental principle to deny God his rightful place in worship. The altar and sacrifice, you see, were central to the relationship between the people and God. This is how uh, John L. in his commentary in Exodus put it. Because it was only through the provision of atonement that sinners who had offended God could hope to enter his presence in an acceptable manner. And they had long forgotten this great reality. That it was only through atonement that sinners who had offended God could hope to enter his presence in an acceptable manner. What had the temple become? It had become abandoned, desecrated, abused, maligned and ignored. And the people thought it doesn't matter. And this is the worrying thing, the sobering thing that comes from Josiah's time. That people who abandon the worship of God, and refuse to worship God, and refuse to acknowledge God. Once you deny God, anything goes. Jeremiah, in his preaching, at the time of Josiah, the prophet began his ministry. And in chapter 17, we have these words, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. And test the mind to give everyone according to his ways, according to the fruit of their deeds. Jeremiah wrote these words in chapter 17. He lived and saw in his lifetime what Josiah saw himself. The wickedness of the heart, the expressiveness of sin, the determination of sinfulness to deny God his rightful place in their lives and in their hearts. And so what does Josiah do? Verse 2, he appointed the priests to their offices and encouraged them in the service of the house of the Lord. His worship then was regular, regulative. It was ordered. It was instructive. It was, we could say, inclusive. Everyone was called in. And I want to just leave it there and ask you today where your heart is today. The principles of worship, where we see that Josiah was focused on the character and activity of his God. When we focus in on the character and activity of God, what do we see? We see the cross. Jesus Christ, his son, who died there that we might be forgiven and that we might live for him day by day. And that's what that wonderful line in the Wilberforce's tribute is all about. He added the abiding eloquence of a Christian life. That's what God calls us all to do today and it begins with and flows from the worship of God. May he bless us all today as we follow him, live for him and commit to his worship day by day. Lord we thank you that we can learn from the ancient text principles and values that must shape us today to live for your glory. We would pray, Lord, that you'd be with us and that you would enable us to live that life of abiding eloquence, a life given to Jesus Christ. 
And so may we know today the grace and mercy and peace of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and always. Amen.